Okay, um, so thank you very much, Dan, and uh, I'd like to introduce um, our next speaker, Dr. Ron Linden, who, as you can see, has come all the way from uh, Canada. Um, and uh, I, I first heard his, his talk in um, Durban at the, the Tricon conference recently, and I thought it was so important to bring it to this audience that we sort of went, went right up, and myself and Mike went straight up to Ron and said, can you come over and, and do this talk here, because I think it's a hugely important um, uh, topic currently. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Ron. Thanks, Ali. Thanks for inviting me to come here. Um, I work full time at the Judy Dan Research and Treatment Center in Toronto, Canada. I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Ken Day, who many of you know, contributed to this presentation. When I say Toronto, Canada, many of you think Canada is the Great White North, the Great White Frozen North, and Toronto has been somewhere between the Arctic Circle and the North Pole, but that's not true. And to prove it, I took a photograph of my home just before coming here. <laughs> Paul Rose here? <laughs> He's got, uh, he should have used an igloo much better than a tent. <laughs> Toronto actually is quite a cosmopolitan city, sitting on the north side, a north shore of Lake Ontario. On the south shore is the United States. And with all the events happening in the White House over the last two years, many Canadians want to remove Canada from North America. And that would make Brexit look quite easy. <laughs> Disclosures? Thanks, Ollie. No commercial conflict of interest. Significant portion of my income is from providing hyperbaric oxygen. Majority of my patients have diabetic foot ulcers. Prior to the study, I was a full-time clinician, not a researcher. This was my first research study. I was a co-investigator, aligned to randomizations and outcomes until after the study was completed. I am giving this presentation without the consent of the other investigators and institutions. I personally recruited all patients, provided all wound care, patient care facilities, hyperbaric chambers and treatments. I'm named on the protocol, the research ethics board approval, clinicaltrials.gov, the trials methodology, publication, and the report to the government. That will become relevant later. After the study was complete, I discovered the study report and the publication were false, misleading. I had no choice but to expose the truth. It became something that I never aspired to become, never wanted to become, I don't even like the title, but I became a whistleblower. I looked up the thesaurus and there aren't any good synonyms for this. <laughs> As my friend Ken said, the only good synonyms are rat, fake, and a few other nasty terms. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll stick to whistleblower. So uh, the other researchers, of course, and the supervising institution retaliated by filing multiple complaints of research misconduct against me. Outline of the presentation, I'm going to talk about research fraud, uh, Canadian medical care, research ethics and policies, the study report and publication, the problems with the study, scientific and ethical, how the study was false and misleading, uh, violations of the research and publication ethics, and the most important thing, which I'm sure you're interested in, the true patient outcomes, not what was published. A little aside, in Brazil, near Rio, there is, people take spectacular pictures, tempting fate by hanging from this famous rock. Anyone ever seen this? You hang from this rock and you have your picture taken. Anyone want to give it a try? Yes. No, no takers? It's really not that dangerous. Sometimes truth in reality is not what is shown. This rock is only a few feet above the ground. <laughs> it's called fake photography. Why do I show it? There's uh, my pictures. It also applies to research studies. Sometimes truth in reality is not what is shown or published. Dr. Richard Smith, the editor of the British Medical <coughs> Journal, in 2001 said, "Research fraud undermines public trust in medical research <coughs> physicians and harms patients." Corrupt scientific record and leads to false conclusions. And most countries do not have a good system of dealing with research fraud. He also said why it occurs? Because the researchers can get away with it, and because the system works mostly on trust. Richard, or Dr. Richard Horton, editor of Lancet in 2015, said much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may be simply be untrue, afflicted by studies with small sample sizes, tiny effects invalid exploratory analysis and flagrant conflicts of interest. 
Science has taken a turn towards darkness. And William Kingdon Clifford, who was a Victorian Briton, in Ethics of Belief in 1877 wrote, we have a moral obligation to believe responsibly, believe only what we have sufficient evidence for, and believe only what we have diligently investigated. It's always, it's wrong always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. Our beliefs influence our actions. Poor practices of belief formation turn us into careless, credulous believers. And that brings us to the infamous statement by the uh, NHS on the hyperbaric oxygen therapy for diabetic wounds, which stated, the most reliable trial of the Dorco study. It's an infamous statement. I'm going to talk today about how truth, integrity, medical and research ethics are amputated by Fedorco studies, the researchers, and the institutions. Institutional conflicts of interest and research misconduct occur because there's a competitive environment for research funding. It's easy money for health technology assessments, mostly from government agencies and bean counters. There's less rigorous peer review, personal career institutional ambitions for research productivity regardless of the quality and accuracy. It's essential to follow the money trail. Hidden agendas, ulterior motives, intentions to restrict or control healthcare expenditures, and the healthcare insurers and payers who insist on high level data to, from trials to cover up the treatment, but will take or withdraw coverage based on low level data. Canadian healthcare system, any of you familiar with the Canadian healthcare system? It's socialized medical care. We have a single payer, the provincial ministries of health control health care. And private health care is being banned for all essential medicine. The only other country in the world that has our system is North Korea. So we're not in good company. It's illegal to have a private health care center that provides essential medical care. The Ministry of Health determines professional fees for physicians and technical fees for procedures. So for hyperbaric oxygen, there's a fee for physicians to supervise the 14 approved UHMS conditions, but there's no technical fee. In Canada, we have something called the Tri-Council Policy Statement 2, which was published in 14, the ethical conduct for research involving humans, and all, and it includes a section on institutional conflict of interest, and all medical research has to comply with this. There's an agency called the Ontario Health Technology Assessment Committee, called OTAC. It advises the Ministry of Health on funding technology. And back in 2004, 2005, 6, 7, there was an increasing demand for hyperbaric oxygen for diabetic foot ulcers. The Ministry of Health asked OTAC, conduct a study to assess the effectiveness of hyperbaric oxygen for healing wounds and preventing amputations. The sponsor was OTAC. It was conducted by the University Health Network, which I had worked at since 1988 on a part-time basis, providing hyperbaric oxygen for emergency cases. The University Health Network was previously called the Toronto General Hospital and is affiliated with the University of Toronto. The Program for Assessment of Technology and Health, called PATH, affiliated with McMaster University in Hamilton. Dr. Fedorko, who is a hyperbaric physician and anesthetist working in the University Health Network. Dr. O'Reilly, who is a scientists working for PATH, and the research data was collected by Fedorko's friend, who was a nurse. It was listed in clinical trials, and listed as one of the investigators, hyperbaric oxygen therapy for diabetic foot ulcers. And the statement in the clinical trial says, study was recommended by the Ontario Health Technology Advisory Committee. Results of the study will be used to make policy decisions regarding funding and utilization of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It sounds innocent enough, but in hindsight, it, it wasn't. They were also uh, published in trials. The methodology was published. Again, I'm listed there. And the timeline. So we started in 2007. We started enrolling patients in 2008. Enrollment was completed in 2012. The report 
to OTAC was completed in 2012. The study was completed a few months later in 2013. First publication came out in 2016, so there was a three-year gap between completing the study and publishing. And the second publication came out in 2017, which I just found out about a few months ago. Study design, single-centered, double-blind RCT under intention to treat. The interim adjudication was by a vascular surgeon, a single vascular surgeon, blind to the treatments. Originally, it was approved at 18 weeks, and then reduced by the to 12 weeks. The adjudication was for the patient being amputated or meeting the criteria for amputation. Long-term outcomes were critical at 30 and 52 weeks for wound healing, quality of life, and healthcare utilization. The treatment group, we got 100% oxygen, 2.4 atmospheres for 90 minutes with a small air break for five minutes. We're getting this five times a week for six weeks, total of 30 treatments with weekly wound care, followed by six weeks of wound care, adjudication, of course, at week 12. The average number of treatments these patients received was about 25. The control group, 100% air, at 1.3 atmospheres to give a sham treatment for 10 minutes, and then decompress the chamber to one atmosphere for 80 minutes. This is arbitrarily changed by Fedorco to keep them at 1.3 atmospheres. As Shia pointed out a couple years ago, air at 1.3 atmospheres is about the same as 28% oxygen, which is not a placebo. So this study was not a placebo controlled study, but it was a test, to study of high concentration versus a lower concentration of oxygen. And we have done TCOM, the transcutaneous oximetry on patients, with 1.3 atmospheres of air and seen an increase in transcutaneous oximetry readings. Control group also were treated five times a week for six weeks, six weeks of wound care, adjudication at week 12, and if unhealed, could cross over to open label hyperbaric oxygen. And in fact, 80% of them who were unhealed <coughs> before weeks did cross over. What were the issues with the study? I requested the protocol be sent to external experts for review uh, before we started this study to rule out any preventable errors in our design. The uh, re researchers refused my request, and that should have been an alarm bell for me to say, wait a minute, something's wrong. During the study, I informed the investigators of multiple concerns, how the wounds were being analyzed, combining crossovers with intention to treat, because they were in a, apparently I discovered they were planning to report the crossovers as control patients in the final analysis. And Fedorka was rarely at our center supervising the study, and I couldn't reach him for months at a time. My concerns were dismissed. And I discussed putting the study to, with my colleagues, and they advised me, don't put the study, finish it off, criticize it afterwards. So the study, the interim study that came out and the publications. This was the report from PATH to the Ministry of Health, and I listed on it. I was given it one hour before they presented it. I didn't have enough time to read it thoroughly and to comment on it. I knew I was being railroaded. And the report said there was no difference between the treatment and control group adjudicated for amputation or meeting the study criteria for amputation and wound healing. There was no benefit of hyperic option for diabetic foot ulcers. Oops. They're con they concluded on this report, the results are based on the outcomes at the end of 12 weeks and longer term data is necessary to evaluate the use of hyperic oxygen for this indication. An examination of the one year data is essential. And I emphasize that, data two. So the 12 week report was quite shocking. And what it showed was, I don't know, this is low down, I don't know if you can see it from the back. 
but I'll just read it to you. So it talked about the wounds reduction in the length and width and depth. And for the treatment group, it showed an improvement in the treatment group of 18%, and in the placebo group, an improvement of 22%. What was more shocking was the amputation rate. And here it said major and minor amputations in patients, and treatment group, placebo group, and talked about how many major amputations, how many were below knee, how many above the knee, minor amputations, how many were toes, toes and metatarsal, below ankle. And I was shocked to see that 25 out of 51 patients, sorry, 25 out of 49 patients, or 51%, were reported amputated in the treatment group. As compared to the control group, where they only had a 48% amputation rate. 51% amputation rate in 12 weeks. I looked at other studies, seven of them, and I did a crude average of the, of the number of amputations, and the average in all these in the treatment group was about 11%. And here we have the Fedorco study, with the 51% amputation rate, which is five times all the other <coughs> studies. As a physician responsible for all the clinical care for all the patients in the study, these reports didn't match what I saw clinically. I knew 51% were not amputated, and something was very wrong with these, this report. I went through my clinical records to compare. And for the hyperbaric patients at 12 weeks, the 25 reported amputations are meeting the criteria for amputation. In reality, none were actually amputated, not a single one, not a single toe. The 25 were pretend amputations. Pedorcolin pathways have no time to make presentations to the government. Hyperbaric option does not work for diabetic foot officers. I reported my concerns to the other researchers. I said, this doesn't make sense. You're saying 25 patients were amputated. They weren't amputated. When I went off on holiday, they came in and took all the data from our center and refused to give me copies or access to it. That's a violation of research ethics to deny investigator access to data. I received an email from the head of TAP demanding my prior agreement to support the conclusions of the other investigators as a condition for being allowed to remain an author in the study for the publication, but without any ability to preview what they're going to write, or to even look at the manuscript. And they drafted the manuscript and submitted it secretly. This is contrary to the Committee on Publication Ethics and the International Committee on Medical Journal Ethics, or editors, I should say. And so the article went into the Journal of Diabetes Care, 2016. Hyperic auction does not, does not reduce indications for amputations of patients. And you can see the authors, my name's missing. And as uh, was mentioned earlier, as Shai mentioned, people look at the heading, they skim through the content, and they read the conclusions. When you look at all the trials, or sorry, all the publications, clinical trials, I was listed on that. Trial methodology was listed here. OTAC report listed, removed from the publication. And in the publication, they concluded there was no difference between hyperbaric oxygen and control. Hyperbaric oxygen does not reduce the indication for amputation or facilitate wound healing. They concluded the current study did not find any significant benefit with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and we cannot recommend the use of it for reducing amputations or facilitating wound, in this, wound care in this population. Fedorka went on to the Global Wound Care Congress where he came up with some incredible statements. Our prospective double-blind placebo-controlled study, when well, it wasn't placebo, failed to show benefit of hyperbaric oxygen in any measured wound healing outcome. Hyperbaric oxygen is very time-consuming, cost-intensive, requiring daily sessions, other treatment modalities demonstrated to be effective at lower costs. And he said, 
hyperbaric cost may possibly prohibit some patients from obtaining access to several more effective and immediate treatments. These are comments from a person who still provides hyperbaric oxygen therapy at Toronto General Hospital. You recall that the study protocol required wound healing, healthcare resource utilization, quality of life, cost effectiveness, and outcomes at 30 and 52 weeks, which they said was critically important. The Oracle came out with a second publication last year for the quality of life. And it was in this journal here. And he stated, no significant difference in the quality of life were found between the hyperbaric oxygen therapy and sham groups. But this was all based on 12 weeks, not 30 and 52. Of course, there's no difference in amputation and wound healing. At 12 weeks, there's no difference in quality of life. But not a, he did not analyze 30 and 52. So study problems. The methodology was grossly flawed, unethically performed. The results are false, completely false and misleading. In retrospect, the study was designed and conducted to produce a negative outcome. And you have to follow the money trail because 2011, OTEC and PATH released data from the study while we were still enrolling patients. And they secretly released the data to the CEO of one of the hospitals, encouraging him to close this hyperbaric unit because our study was a negative outcome and there was no benefit in keeping this chambers open. We were still recruiting patients. We were unaware that, I was unaware this information was being leaked out. In 2014, they tried to do list hyperbaric oxygen for diabetic foot ulcers, so they wouldn't pay physicians to cover it. 2015, they tried to restrict the expansion of the facilities. In 2016, they tried to restrict hyperbaric oxygen for diabetic foot ulcers. It's all about the beating counters trying to get rid of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Digital photos. The RAB approved protocol was to use a camera, a digital camera, with something called Pixar software to make surface measurements. In other words, just to measure the wound and get the size. Photographs just for comparison to assess the degree of ulceration and compare from week to week. This software frequently crashed and was discarded. Multiple other programs were used without RB approval. And the measurements were often taken, digital measurements were often analyzed months after the wound uh, was had been treated. Uh, precluding any comparison for the digital wound to the actual wound, the manual measurements. Uh, the wound measurements were made by multiple different people without any inter or intra investigator variation measurements. Each wound was measured digitally by a single investigator, and no, there was no comparison between manual and digital measurements. None of this was mentioned in the Diabetic Care Journal. Most important problem. The RAB approved adjudication was for the vascular surgeon to examine the patient. How many vascular surgeons are here? Any? No? None? The method for adjudication for most patients was arbitrarily changed by Fedorco. Non approved, unvalidated adjudication. For most patients, the vascular surgeon only examined a photo of the wound printed on plain paper. There's no RAB amendment ever submitted to change to adjudicate by, by photo instead of, a, mass, instead of a, a physical examination. Using photos to adjudicate for amputation was never described in the RAB application, clinical trials, the trials publication, and the change of protocol was never submitted or reported on clinicaltrials.gov. When we look, when I looked up all the list of changes, there's only one on the outcome measures, and that was changing adjudication from 18 weeks to 12 weeks, not changing it from a vascular surgeon examining a patient to a vascular surgeon examining a picture. So this adjudicating by photo was a violation of the RAB approved protocol. I notified the RAB, and I was ignored, and the study should be invalidated. 
multiple wounds, initially buried two, three, or four, where they enrolled in this, or were recruited, and were well on the way to healing, but not completely closed, so they were grade one wounds, were adjudicated for amputation. And I'll show you photos later. Most wounds falsely adjudicated for amputation were subsequent, subsequently healed within weeks of the adjudication. In fact, viewing a photo, this vascular surgeon adjudicated one patient who had a below knee amputation, whose diabetic foot ulcer had healed, and he only had a planter wart. Now, <clears throat> I don't believe most of us would amputate a leg for a planter wart. Statistically significant results from the published data were present, but the authors did not do the ana analysis. And there's absolutely no relationship between meeting the study's criteria for amputation and actually having an amputation. And Ken Lede did the analysis with this, uh, with this uh, analyst, with this statistician, and the P value is infinitesimally small. It's in the trillions. There was absolutely no relationship between meeting the criteria and having an amputation. Third problem, criteria for amputation. The criteria that we use in Canada normally is for amputation is an unsalvageable extremity or limb due to critical limb ischemia in patients with severe vascular disease or severe life-threatening infection with extensive soft tissue or bony destruction or refractory pain. Criteria that was used in the study were never validated, and they're bogus. Persistent deep infection involving bone and tendons. So the patient was on antibiotics, they'd been hospitalized, but they had a, a culture come back that was positive, it'd automatically be um, adjudicated for amputation. Most of us would just treat this with antibiotics, not amputation. If there was an ongoing risk of severe systemic infection related to the wound, not that they had severe infection, but if they were at risk of it, well, every wound is at risk. They're, at, they're adjudicated for amputation. But all wounds are at risk. Inability to bear weight on the affected limb. For most of us who prescribe orthotics, orthopedic devices, we wouldn't amputate. And lastly, pain. Not refractory pain, but if they had any kind of pain. From a photo, how do you accurately diagnose infection? Risk of severe inf uh, systemic infection, ability to bear weight, or pain. There is absolutely no way. And in fact, when I looked at the, the adjudications and compared to actual outcomes, vascular surgery was wrong more than 80% of the time. And I called him up and I asked him, I said, your, your adjudications are wrong it's actually 83% of the time. I said, how could this be? Did you not use your medical judgment when looking at these photographs? And he said, I wasn't allowed to use my medical judgment. I was pigeonholed into choosing adjudication for amputation for anybody who met any of these criteria. That's what I had to do. So if they had any of these criteria, it was an automatic amputation or adjudication for amputation. Fourth problem. Timing of the adjudication. The Londell study, which fortunately came out in 2012, showed that the differences between the control and hyperbaric groups starts after three months and is maximum at six to 12 months. We don't see anything below three months. Our study was approved to be adjudicated 18 weeks, which should have shown a difference. It would have shown a difference. But Fedorko moved that back to 12 weeks. The question is why? 12 weeks was too early to detect differences. And why move from 18 to 12? Well, shorter interval, less time, less likely to show healing. For an unrelated trial, Fedorko emailed the sponsor and copied me accidentally. It said, I can design a study to prove whatever you want it to prove. Great line. <laughs> Great integrity. The design of the study should be that it will show positive results and the risk of negative trial should be eliminated. 
This is a drug they wanted to bring in. Needless to say. And all most positive trials had a treatment follow-up at six months. Negative trials had a shorter follow-up. He knew exactly what he was doing. As you recall, the past report to OTAC said longer-term data are necessary in order to evaluate the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy for this indication. Long-term data, 30 weeks and 52 weeks. Wound status, amputation, quality of life, healthcare resource utilization. All this is supposed to be reported, 30 and 52 weeks. Part of the protocol. That 30 and 52 week data has been hidden. It's never been reported or published. They will not release it because it contradicts everything they've published. And I can tell you from going through my records that in the hyperbaric treated group, healing rate was 78%. 80% of the unhealed control group crossed over, and their healing rate was in the 60%, right, 65%. There's very few control patients who had not crossed over in quite one year. So we had a 78% success rate with these patients, but I'm not supposed to talk about that because I don't have any data to publish it. And they won't release it. Clinical records for the hyperbaric option patients demonstrated that the 25 that they said were amputated at 12 weeks, in reality, five were actually amputated at one year. And they were all toe amputations not below knee, toe amputations. So we take the five amputations, five out of, oops, sorry, five out of 25 patients, we had, uh, sorry, uh, we had about five amputations, which is about a 10% amputation rate out of 50 patients. And 10% uh, is pretty close to the average of these other studies. So we're not far off the other studies, five amputations. Problem six, forgery. I requested copies of all the documentation that the REB had on the study, and I got the original application that Fedorko had submitted himself. And in that documentation, it was a section on conflict of interest that all the investigators were supposed to sign. I'd never seen it. And when I looked at it carefully, I saw my name there and what's purported to be my signature. That's not my signature. That's forgery. My signature was forged on this application and submitted by Fedorko without my knowledge. That's my signature. That's what was submitted. He didn't even spell my name right. <laughs> <laughs> Fedorko also did not renew the REV approval during one year of the study, 2009. All data collected without REV approval should not have been uh, used, should have been validated. I filed complaints about forgery, false and misleading results, confiscation of data, and multiple protocol violations to UHN, to OTAC, and requested an independent external expert review. And they refused, flat out refused. I started getting calls from all over the world. What went wrong with your study? What happened? And I put together an abstract on how digital photos are not reliable for determining the need for amputation of diabetic foot ulcers for the UHMS annual general meeting in 2013. And I actually sent a copy to the other investigators and said, would you like to co-author this with me? <laughs> <laughs> a little poke in the eye. And not only did they say no, <laughs> But I got letters demanding that I retract it from the researchers and UHN. And when I refused to retract it, I actually offered to retract it if they agreed to an independent review of the study, and they said no. So I said, I'm going ahead with the presentation. And they tried to block my presentation by contacting UHMS and saying, pull this presentation. UHMS said, no, we've never had a request like that ever, and we're not going to do it. So I went ahead and gave the presentation. Immediately, UHM 
um, pulled our rug out of us and they uh, were launching an inquiry. And uh, they appointed an inquiry panel, which was a kangaroo court. Apologies to any Australians in the room. There's one at least somewhere, Fiona, where she, there she is. <laughs> this court of three, two of them were colleagues of Fedorco. I co authored papers with them. And the third one was a researcher who worked from TAF who did the study. So they <laughs> wasn't independent. They, were, they all had conflicts of interest, but they're all appointed. And when I complained about it, they said, too bad. Adjudicating uh, Fedorko retroactively claimed two studies to justify adjudicating by photo. And these two studies, uh, one by Houghton, one by Worthlin, had nothing to do with amputation whatsoever and cannot be used to justify adjudicating for a person's needs to lose a limb. The inquiry panel uh, dismissed every single complaint that I had, everyone. They said Fedorko did not have an REB approval for using photo adjudication, but it was an administrative error. That's all. And he'd be applying for retroactive REB approval. They also admitted it was a lapse in their REB approval for one year. That was a mistake, and they gave him retroactive special permission to use the data for that year. And administration of placebo was not provided as outlined in the study protocol. And multiple participants did not meet the inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria, but they're making a retroactive amendment for that. And the forgery was immaterial. They didn't care. <laughs> the, panel, the panel determined that Fedorko's responses were fine, they were justified, and no action was required. Uh, retroactive protocol revision and REB approval is misconduct, according to the UHN's own research ethics rules, and according to our Tri-Council policy. If the primary outcome is done without REB approval, it's research misconduct. If they granted a retroactive approval, it's institutional research misconduct. The inquiry panel, <laughs> not exactly being unbiased, um, then filed half a dozen complaints against me, including conflict of interest, because I'd signed this document saying I was not in a conflict of interest. I pointed out to them, uh, that's not my signature, it's a forgery. They said it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and numerous other <laughs> the inquiry panel became the investigation panel same people so they investigated their own complaints against me <laughs> not exactly fair that's my absolute definition of a kangaroo report so I knew I was going to get hung one way or the other and they came out with uh, their conclusions that I used unauthorized use and disclosure of confidential data. Well, that's the definition of being a whistleblower, but uh, this is not confidential data. It's all publicly funded study. So there's nothing confidential here. They said I made statements contrary to good faith reporting against the study. True. And it's all backed up by evidence. <coughs> I failed to use scholarly and scientific rigor analyzing and reporting the results, whatever and that I conducted research without RB approval myself by looking at my own medical records to see who was amputated and who wasn't. So it's okay for Fedorko to do a whole year without research approval and to retroactively change the protocols, but I can't check my own records to see who was amputated and who wasn't. Uh, all this is really retaliation against the whistleblower. And if I'm guilty of anything, oh, I should say one more thing. Um, these findings were all appealed. And while I was in Durban, the appeal was going in. And we were led to be well, help with the help of Canada Day. And I was told that he was informed that the date was November the 5th, that everything had to be in July. We submitted by October 18th. And they came back and said, sorry, we changed the date. It's October the 8th. Your appeal came in 10 days too late. We're not going to look at your appeal. And the matter's closed. <laughs> a little bit of trickery on their side. I am guilty of being a whistleblower. 
that's for sure. So, um, I did not realize the true purpose of the study was to prove hyperbaric oxygen does not work for diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, UHM did not ensure research integrity, just protecting its reputation and its funding. The vice president of the hospital, who was in charge, who was actually in charge of the lead of the REV research, said to my face he didn't want anyone questioning the quality of the research and threatening his $300 million research budget. I informed the University of Toronto what was going on, and they said they didn't want to get involved. And it's institutional lack of responsibility to ensure research integrity according to the required policies. <coughs> now, the question is, this is a pretty bizarre story, but would UHN physicians and researchers produce and cover up a false misleading research study and shoot the messenger, sacrificing patients' health and lives for money? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes. And it happened before. Dr. Nancy Oliveri, a hematologist, was dismissed for exposing the harmful side effects of a pediatric medication that was in a drug trial at UHN. It was killing the children. And she couldn't ignore it. So she exposed it, informed the public. The hospital fired her. Found her guilty of all kinds of research misconduct and fired her. It went to the Supreme Court of Canada, who ruled against the UHM in a favor of the doctor. They had to rehire her and give her a credit of sizable uh, settlement. The Committee on Publication Ethics has clear guidelines over research. Journal editors should retract a publication if the findings are unreliable or fraudulent, or there's unethical research. The article submitted a publication without my name, a violation of research ethics. The journal did not conclude, uh, conduct, I should say, due diligence. You should not have published a study where one of the authors listed on clinical trials is missing, or they should at least investigate it. And they shouldn't have published a study that lacked REB approval or received retroactive approval for the primary outcome measurement. And multiple requests for withdrawal or retraction of the publication have been refused by the journal. They've also refused to publish multiple letters critical of the study. Dr. Ken Day wrote a superb critique of the study. Uh, he submitted to a number of journals who said they didn't want to touch it because it was too hot. They didn't want to get involved in controversy. So it was published by the Underseen Hyperbaric Medical Journal. And in it, it basically states serious concerns about the Toronto Hyperbaric Auction for Diabetic Foot Ulcer Study. And he lists the problems. The study lacked uh, REB approval a validated primary outcome measure, a valid power analysis to show the difference between the two groups, compliance with applicable policies and authorship, scientific information or sound study design and conduct. I don't know if many of you know, but last year, 12 hyperbaric uh, societies published an open letter critical of the Fedorco study. Understand Hyperbaric Medical Society, the European Barometric Society, and all the others. I don't know if the British medical review approached. They they did not approach us, and we uh, we 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 appealed. They said, unfortunately, the letter had been sent, and they apologized that they didn't approach us. That would make thirteen. All right. And basically, this letter said negative results are largely based on two published studies that either have corrupt data, referring to the Fedorco study, and or poor design. So the path report, the interim report that I showed you, is false. The publication of diabetic care or diabetes care, false. What about the OTAC's attempt to encourage the hospital to close their hyperbaric unit, delist hyperbaric auction, or restrict it, or restrict the facilities? I had multiple meetings with the government. I'm pleased to say that was cancelled. All of it. What really happened to the patients? Well, I'm going to show you some pictures of our patients. We have enough time? Yeah. And I have a very short film clip at the end which says it all. Case one, baseline picture, grade three wound. 
12 weeks, adjudicated for amputation. Would any of you amputate this toe or this leg? Break one wound. Adjudicated for amputation. Five weeks later, healed. Case two, grade three wound, post TNA. At 12 weeks, adjudicated for amputation of his leg. Four weeks later, completely healed. Another patient, grade two wound, at 12 weeks still open, but healing. Four weeks later, healed. All these are adjudicated for amputation. Another case, baseline, grade two, at 12 weeks adjudicated for amputation, Nine weeks later, couldn't find the wound. And more difficult one, the Charcot foot, baseline, 12 weeks, still open, but 11 months later, completely healed. I'll show you a, a short video one of our patients. I have four videos, I'm just showing you the best one. I was enrolled in this study on the use of hyperbaric oxygen treatment on diabetic foot wounds in April of 2011. My patient number is 1121. I have been informed that a physician made a decision to amputate both of my legs in July 2011 based on viewing the photographs of my wounds. He did not examine me. The date today is October 4th, 2013, and it is more than two years since I supposedly had my legs amputated. I'm cons consenting for this video to prove that no amputation ever took place and that I still have both of my legs and my toes as of this date. Five years later, she still has both legs and all her toes. This false, misleading, non-ethical study should not be used to guide treatment or treatment funding. That brings us back to the NHS evidence review the most reliable trial for Darko. Really? False. And the NHS conclusions that it's a high quality study with the authors enhanced the reliability by using sham HBOT as a placebo control. And this is all nonsense, it's all false. Dr. Lede has created an online petition that will be sent to the editor of Diabetes Care and the president of the UHN to withdraw or retract the Fedora publication. If you'd like to sign it, stop amputating the truth about bogus Toronto University Health Network research and health care option for diabetic wounds. Uh, the website is thepetitionsite.com. You just have to Google hyperbaric. Or here's the website here. But if you go to thepetitionsite.com and look hyperbaric, you'll find it. Last time I looked, we had about 400 signatures. We're aiming for about 1,000. Thank you.